Even though Jesus himself was Jewish and followed the demands of the Mosaic law, he taught that his own death and resurrection would launch a new and better covenant. And better because you didn't have to live up to the demands of 613 laws in order to draw near to God. You could come near to him through faith in Jesus. So what does that mean when it comes to which rules we should follow? Well, it means that Christians take their cues from Jesus and the apostles rather than from Moses. You don't have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. He even commands his Jewish apostles to abandon their rigid devotion to some of the Mosaic laws by eating things like bacon. If you're a Christian and you decide that you're, the law of Moses still has jurisdiction over you, and you place yourself back under it, then Christ will not profit you anything. There won't be any salvation in Christ. The, the Sabbath, the thing about the Sabbath is I, I think it's fairly clear in Scripture. You read Colossians, I posted it on my Instagram. And then I think if you look at church history, like I don't see a single, not, not from Justin Martyr to Calvin and Edwards, none of these guys took a literal Sabbath. So you mean to tell me that all of Christendom got the Sabbath wrong? That whole part of the Old Testament law, that ceremonial part is gone. That's why in Colossians, Paul says, don't let anybody hold you to a new moon, a festival, or any kind of food. But we're no longer under Old Testament dietary laws. So they're gone. So you can feel free uh, to eat anything. To think all of Christendom, every Christian, got the Sabbath wrong. It seems like many modern day Christian leaders are taking pride in the fact that there have been strong figures in the church that have maintained biblical principles and that they themselves are carrying on this tradition. And anybody who deviates from these traditional values are heretics. But what if the ones who thought they were maintaining true biblical doctrine are actually the ones who have deviated. And these views that they hold so strongly to are actually mere traditions of men. And the ones that they claim have maintained an accurate position on certain biblical doctrines have actually led the church astray. I think it's an important question to ask considering how much weight is put on these figures, namely the early church fathers and their views. If you're unsure about what I'm talking about, here's a small example of someone using these figures as evidence that their perspectives concerning scripture and doctrine is accurate. The Grace to You website run by John MacArthur gives his reason why Christians don't need to keep the Sabbath day. The early church fathers from Ignatius to Augustine taught that the Old Testament Sabbath had been abolished and that the first day of the week, Sunday, was the day when Christians should meet for worship, contrary to the claim of many Seventh-day Sabbatarians who claim that Sunday worship was not instituted until the 4th century. So since we have influential people like John MacArthur and so many others appealing to early believers and what they taught as evidence that their positions of non-observance of certain commandments is the proper position, it's important that we get a good idea of what exactly these men said. And as we go back to the time directly after the apostles, I want to remind everyone of the warnings that the apostles had about what would happen after they fell asleep. Acts 20, verse 29 through 31. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Jude verse 3 and 4. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. See, as much as these men, like Paul and Jude, wanted to talk about how great salvation was and how freeing it was to be in Christ and to live as a follower of him, Jude says, I can't talk about that right now because there's something more pressing. And it's that the faith will be under attack. There will be men who come in who look like sheep, who look like one of us, but they will come in teaching perverse things. So their warning is make sure that you are watching. And guess what? 
that's exactly what happened. But when the sacred band of the apostles had in various ways reached the end of their life, and the generation of those privileged to listen with their own ears to the divine wisdom had passed on, then godless error began to take shape, through the deceit of false teachers, who now that none of the apostles was left threw off the mask, and attempted to counter the preaching of the truth by preaching the knowledge falsely so called. So Eusebius records that Gnosticism was on the rise, and many believers were influenced by them. And he continues, Thus it came about that with the help of these ministers, the demon that delights in evil enslaved their pitiable dupes and ample grounds for speaking ill of the divine message, since the talk to which they gave rise circulated widely and involved the whole Christian people in calumny. This was the main reason why that wicked and outrageous suspicion regarding us was current among the unbelievers at that time. The suspicion that we practice unlawful intercourse with mothers and sisters and took part in unhallowed feasts. One of the most deceptive teachings that made its way into the church was Gnosticism. This was something that even the apostles came against. So while I stand with anybody who is standing against Gnosticism, the question that lingers in my mind is, is this specifically what the apostles were warning about? Or was there more? Were there deceptive teachings that have gone almost undetected, even to this day, that were sown in these early years? Notice Eusebius's concern here. His concern and frustration was that unbelievers would think that they were breaking certain commandments and partaking in feasts that were not hallowed by God. This is my concern as well. My concern is, are Christians today breaking certain commandments and keeping feasts that are not authorized in Scripture? Because if they are, they're giving unbelievers a bad understanding of what following Christ looks like. And if you're a new believer or a non-believer just searching the internet for answers about which commandments to keep and not keep, you'll usually get answers similar to John MacArthur's or something like this. When I searched up, should Christians keep the law, this is the answer I got. The law given to Moses at Sinai was abrogated with the advent of the new covenant. To put it in a better way, the entirety of the Mosaic Covenant was fulfilled in Christ. The law of Moses no longer serves as direct and immediate judge over the lives and conduct of God's people. God's children today obey the law of Christ. Jesus, who is better than Moses, in his Sermon on the Mount, served as the new lawgiver, establishing his new commandments. In that sermon, he expounded on the law that Jeremiah 31 said would be written in the believer's inward parts. So, while early Christians fought against Gnostics, and rightly so, the question is, did they also let go of the line in other areas? And is this why we have so many Christians today repeating these same narratives? We're going to take a look at some key figures and events in history from the time following the apostles to today to see what they said concerning these things, starting with Ignatius of Antioch. Here's what he says about the Sabbath day. This is what John MacArthur and so many others today use as their evidence for early Christians not observing the Seventh-day Sabbath. In his epistle to the Magnesians, he writes, If therefore those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in the observance of the Lord's Day, on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death, let us therefore no longer keep the Sabbath after the Jewish manner, and rejoice in the days of idleness, for he that does not work, let him not eat. Okay, so just a few things to go over with Ignatius and his position here is that his position is that Christians, followers of Christ, should no longer observe the Seventh-day Sabbath instituted in Genesis chapter 2 at the creation week and commanded in uh, Exodus 20 verse 8 and all around the, the scriptures. He says we should not observe that. We should observe the first day of the week that he refers to as the Lord's Day. And so his proof text here for why we shouldn't keep the Seventh-day Sabbath anymore is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So we're going to go and look at that and see, is this what Paul was talking about when he said, if he that does not work, let him not eat? Because his point in bringing this verse up is saying, hey, if you're going to be lazy and be idle on the Sabbath day, you don't get to eat. And Paul was reprimanding people for being lazy and idle on the Sabbath day. So let's let's see if that's what Paul actually says here. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul says, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, 
not working at all, but are busybodies. So it's interesting that Ignatius uses this verse as a proof text for why we shouldn't be lazy or rest on the seventh day Sabbath, but we should actually work on that day, because if we don't, we'll, we won't eat. Paul is not even referring to the Sabbath. He's talking about people who don't want to work at all, all week long, not just one day. And so this was a verse completely taken out of context by Ignatius to prove that his position on uh, the Lord's Day observance versus the Seventh-day Sabbath day observance is uh, correct. It's, it's just interesting how you have people who will take these people as evidence for why they don't observe certain things, but you go back and see what they say about it, and it just doesn't hold water. And so one more thing to point out here about Ignatius and his concerning language, one of the things he says is that those who do observe the Seventh-day Sabbath are idle, right? He said, let us rejoice in the days of idleness. Yeah, we were idle before, but and we can rejoice in that, but no longer. No longer do we uh, live in idleness on the seventh day. We work. Let me just take you back to Exodus and show you similar language used by a certain individual. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. So here the Lord is calling his people out of Egypt to free them from slavery and bondage, to bring them into uh, an understanding of his ways. And one of those ways that he's wanting to show them is his feasts. He wants to, he wants to eat with them. He wants to commune with them. And so that's what the feasts are. And by the way, the Sabbath is a feast. If you look at Leviticus chapter 23, it's mentioned as one of the feasts. And so the Lord is calling the people out to come feast with him, to, to bask in freedom. And this is Pharaoh's response. But he said, you are idle, idle. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So it's very concerning that you have people using similar language as Pharaoh, who was a typology of the Antichrist. And we're using his language to say, now we don't follow the Lord's commandments. You have to ask yourself, as we go through these slides, is this the, the work of Christ that has brought us to this point? Or is it the work of the devil in history? So that's what we're going to get to the bottom of. And next is a man who needs no introduction. Many people, Catholics, non-denominations, denominations all over, hail this man as a great uh, apologist. And he did, I will, I will agree, he, he did fight against Gnosticism very well. And I'll stand with him again. But Justin, did, he let go of the line in so many areas, including this arena. And so let's take a look at what Justin says about this subject. In his dialogue with Trifo, who was a, uh, Trifo was a Jewish rabbi, he was not messianic, but Justin's answer to Trifo about why they don't keep the Sabbath is this. For since you have read, O Trifo, as you yourself admitted, the doctrines taught by our Savior, I do not think that I have done foolishly in adding some sh short utterance of his to the prophetic statements. Wash, therefore, and be now clean, and put away iniquity from your souls, as God bids you be washed in his labor, and be circumcised with the true circumcision. For we too would observe the fleshly circumcision, and the Sabbaths, and in short all the feasts, if we did not know for what reason they were enjoined you, namely, on account of your transgressions and the hardness of your hearts. So, Justin's reason here for why he doesn't keep the Sabbath he doesn't get circumcised in the flesh, and he doesn't observe the festivals, the feasts, is because he knows why they were given to the Jews. Because they're a bunch of sinners, and they have hard hearts. That's why the Sabbaths were given to the Jews. That's why they don't observe them. It's just very interesting <laughs> that you look in Scripture and see why, why is it exactly that God gave these commandments to, to Israel, his people? Is that really what the Scriptures say? Because they were the biggest sinners on the face of the earth. That's why God gave them the Sabbaths and the, the feasts and the dietary instructions and the circumcision because they were the most horrible people on the face of the earth. 
and the most hard-hearted. That's why he gave them to them. Let's take a look at what the scriptures say, why the father gave them these instructions. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord sh showed us signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe, against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in, to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So there's a few reasons here that we get why the Lord gave his people these commandments. One, it was to fear him, so they would know how, why and how to fear the Lord their God. It would be their, their standard of righteousness. It would be good for them, right? He did it because he wanted good for them, not because they were filthy, rotten sinners and he wanted to punish them with the Sabbaths and the festivals and the dietary instructions, but because he wanted them to have good. And also, he directly says after why, it's because he brought them out of the land of Egypt. It's because he, got, he gave them salvation. So in return, they're to serve him. That's why he brought them out. It was so that they could serve him and keep his commandments. And that's just exactly why Christ came. To give us salvation. And in turn, we would reciprocate that love by obeying his commandments. Which are not different from the Father's. And so what's interesting about Justin and why he rejects these commandments because the transgressions of them and their hard hearts. It's interesting because is that not why the Messiah was given to earth? It was because of transgressions and because people were hard hearted. And so Christ came and wanted to redeem a people for himself from every lawless deed and break the hard and stony hearts of the people, soften them by his sacrifice and what he has done for us to become our high priest to atone for us. That's why the Messiah was given. So the reason why Justin rejects the law, it would only be consistent to reject Christ because that was why he was given. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation, that's Yeshua, has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so while Justin Martyr rejects the law because he knows why it was given, it's apparent that he actually didn't know why it was given. And so... Is that a sufficient reason to reject the Sabbath, the festivals, the dietary instructions, and the fleshly circumcision? I would say Justin's arguments don't hold water at all. So continuing through history, I want to show you another very influential document that was read and was used to be drawn doctrine, to be drawing doctrine from. And that writing is called the Epistle of Barnabas. And in it, it refers to the Sabbath and why Christians don't observe it as well. And so let's see what in the Epistle of Barnabas the reason for non-observance of these things is. For he has made manifest to us by all the prophets that he wanteth neither sacrifices nor whole burnt offerings nor oblations, saying at one time, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, saith the Lord? I am full of whole burnt offerings and the fat of lambs and of blood, of bulls and of goats I desire not, not though ye should come to be seen of me. For who required these things at your hands? You shall continue no more to tread my court. If you bring fine flour, it is vain. Incense is an abomination to me. Your new moons and your Sabbaths I cannot away with. These things, therefore, he annulled, that the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ, being free from the yoke of constraint, might have its ablation not made by human hands. So here in the Epistle of Barnabas, you see their reason for why they don't observe 
all these things is because Christ brought a new law and abolished the old one. So it's no surprise that you see these things because when you when you look at the slide that I showed you previously of you know random answers on Google, you got to ask yourself where these come from. They have an an origin, right? And these are the things that played key roles in influencing and shaping how people understood Christianity in these early days. So the question is, because he brings up scripture, again, for his proof text of why we don't observe the Sabbath and it being abolished, he says and quotes from Isaiah 1 and saying basically that God hates the new moons, the Sabbaths, and the festivals. So we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 1 and see, is this exactly what he was saying? Was God saying that he hates what he instituted, what he, what he told his people to do and observe? Does he hate that? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and of the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. And so some things that the epistle of Barnabas does not include from this verse is interesting. It's actually the things that give this verse its full context. And if you look closely, one of the things that the Lord says in Isaiah is that he cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meetings. And so this is the reason why he didn't like his people observing the Sabbath and doing the festivals is because they had iniquity in their hearts. He does not want to join the holy and the profane in his house. He wants pure hands and a clean heart. So he continues and says, You are a trouble. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. In worship, he will hide his eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. The Lord is not going to hear those who don't want to observe his law, even impartiality. And so it's a scary thing when you hear Christians today saying, yeah, some of the things I, I keep, but other things I don't keep because it doesn't apply to me. But what if you're only obeying his law in partiality and you're actually locked out of the throne room because you're not observing some of the things that he wants you to observe? See, this is what the Proverbs say. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. So in this epistle, Barnabas' explanation for why we don't observe these things is because Christ abolished them. Okay, And someone who says similar things is Victorinus, who was a commentator in the early 4th century, and he wrote a commentary called the, On the Creation of the World, and he makes similar comments. He says, The sixth day is called the Perceive, that is to say, the preparation of the kingdom. On this day also, on account of the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ, we make either a station to God or a fast. On the seventh day, he rested from all his works and blessed it and sanctified it. On the former day, we are accustomed to fast rigorously, that on the Lord's day we may go forth to our bread with giving of thanks, and let the perceive become a rigorous fast, lest we should appear to observe any Sabbath with the Jews, which Sabbath Christ in his body abolished. So, again, similar language being said between Victorinus and the epistle of Barnabas, which came earlier, by the way. So, one could only imagine and think that Victorinus was influenced by this writing. And the letter of Barnabas also became part of a manuscript in the early 4th century called Codex Sinaiticus, and it was included in the New Testament next to the shepherd of Hermas. So people were using this and seeing this as scripture and drawing doctrine from it. So people, people obviously were influenced by this, people like Victorinus. And Victorinus was also influential. So it's no surprise that people are going around saying, no, that's abolished. Jesus abolished the Sabbath. Jesus abolished this commandment. 
when you have this narrative being peddled so early on. So in their minds, this is the work of Christ. I'm thinking that this is the work of the devil in history because Christ told us what he was coming to do and what he wasn't doing when he came. Here's what he says. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so we have Christ himself telling us that he didn't come to abolish the law. He did not come to do that. So why do you have people saying that he did? You have to think about these things, especially if you're not a Sabbath keeper. And these are the reasons why you don't keep it. And this is why you have people like John MacArthur also saying it's not Constantine. Despite these Seventh-day Sabbatarians thinking it was Constantine, no, this was going on much earlier that people were moving from Sabbath keeping and dietary instructions and moving away from the fleshly circumcision and the, the feast and all this. It was way earlier than Constantine. I agree. I agree, which is why I wanted to do this presentation so that we would understand that they are right. And if you're talking to somebody who knows history, they're going to think you're, you're ignorant for saying it was Constantine because it was going on way before Constantine ever did anything concerning these commandments. Constantine played a key role in shaping this Christianity that we see in, in modern days, but he didn't, it didn't start with them. But we will look at how Constantine did solidify a lot of these erroneous perspectives and views concerning the scripture. And so let's go to the early fourth century where there was a meeting at Milan. And at this meeting, Constantine made an edict where he said, when with happy auspices, I, Constantinus Augustus, and I, Licinius Augustus, had arrived at Milan and were inquiring into all matters that concern the advantage and benefit of the public, among the other measures directed to the general good, or rather as questions of highest priority, we decided to establish rules by which respect and reverence for the deity would be secured, i.e. to give the Christians and all others liberty to follow whatever form of worship they chose, so that whosoever divine and heavenly powers exist might be enabled to show favor to us and to all who live under our authority. This, therefore, is the decision that we reach by sound and careful reasoning. No one, whatever, was to be denied the right to follow and choose the Christian observance or form of worship, and everyone was to have permission to give his mind to that form of worship which he feels to be adapted to his needs, so that the deity might be enabled to show us in all things his customary care and generosity. And so here is this famous edict where Catholics and a lot of denominations hail Constantine as this Christian hero where he made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire. And so he he's a hero to them because he stopped persecution for, for Christians and all other forms of worship. So there's a couple things that I want to point out here about Constantine. You might find out, and I think you will as we go along here, that he was not a Christian by any means. And so to hail him as some sort of Christian hero is, is, uh, is, is kind of scary, especially when we go through here and we're going to find out what exactly what his goal was. His goal was not to make Christianity a, a great religion and to stop them from being persecuted, even though they were at this time being persecuted his goal was a lot bigger than that and you can see that by what he says here is, is that all religions were to stop being persecuted and he says that he wants to establish rules by which respect and revere the deity so that he could have his blessing or whoever deity it was would look at rome and the judgment would not be on rome because he's trying to protect all these religions so what is his heart for wanting to protect all these religions, it's not because he cares for the Christians and Christianity or for, for what they believe. It's because at this time, they were trying to restabilize the Roman Empire. They had gone through a lot. And so finally, you have Constantine having this superstitious kind of mindset of, well, someone's God is right, so let's just make sure that we're not persecuting any of them because the one who is true is going to look at us and say, okay, well, Rome isn't, isn't persecuting them so let's have mercy on them this was constantine's heart here 
So it was more superstitious than anything. So this is, you know, this is the kind of discernment that we need when we're thinking and, and, and reading about these things and hearing people say, oh, Constantine, what a great hero for the Christians. And he did so many good things. We need to be discerning of the fact that he could just be a snake. And I love this, the, the quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says this, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. My point in bringing that up is that, is he a Christian or is he not? Because if you think that he was just trying to protect Christians with this edict, I want to continue on and show you this slide where you can see a coin that was continuing to be minted four years after this edict. And on this inscription on the front, it says Constantine, emperor and commander in chief. And on the back, it says to the invincible sun god, companion of the emperor now this sun god that constantine was revering in this coin and that he's associated with being a companion of is the sun god sol invictus and so constantine was a sun god worshiper specifically worshiping sol invictus which is why a few years later after these coins were minted and a few years later after this edict he says this and makes this edict on the venerable day of the sun sunday let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. And so in the Roman Empire, Constantine had just hallowed the day of the sun, Sunday, as the day where everybody's not going to have to, to work anymore, do their servile work. They can rest and take it easy. Kind of sounds like a Sabbath, doesn't it? You can kind of see his heart, right? He's he's not he's not interested in protecting the Christians and and their command and the commandments that they that they are to observe. He's interested in establishing something else. So later on, you have these meetings with very high, powerful people meeting and congregating because there is there were still disputes going on in the Roman Empire about how Christianity should be observed. You know, should we keep the Sabbath? Should we keep the, the festivals in this day or this day? And so Constantine, even though you can see he wasn't Christian at all, he still involved himself and wanted to be involved in the shaping and the development of what Christianity was going to look like in the Roman Empire. So another meeting was called an ecumenical council called the Council of Nicaea. And at this council, there was a specific issue that they were speaking of that Constantine was involved in about when the Passover was going to be observed. Was it going to be on Sunday or was it going to be on the 4th, 14th of Nisan? when the scriptures say. And so this is what the conversation looked like, and this is what Constantine's thoughts were on this issue. At this meeting, the Council of Nicaea, the question concerning the most holy day of the Pascal celebration was discussed, and it was resolved by the united judgment of all present that this feast ought to be kept by all and in every place on one and the same day, Sunday. For what can be more becoming or honorable to us than that this feast from which we date our hopes of immortality should be observed unfailing by all alike, according to one ascertained order and arrangement? And first of all, it appeared an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast, we should follow the practice of the Jews, who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin, and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. For we have it in our power, if we abandon their custom, to prolong the due observance of this ordinance to future ages, by a truer order, which we have preserved from the very day of the Passion until the present time. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. That sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? That the Mosaic Law was done away with and Christ brought a new law? Continuing on. A course at once legitimate and honorable lies open to our most holy religion. Beloved brethren, let us with one consent adopt this course and withdraw ourselves from all participation in their baseness. For their boast is absurd indeed that it is not in our power without instruction from them to observe these things. In brief, that I may express my meaning in a few words as possible. It has been determined by the common judgment of all that the most holy day of Easter should be kept on one and the same day, Sunday. For on the one hand, a discrepancy of opinion 
on so sacred a question is unbecoming. And on the other, it is surely best to act on a decision which is free from strange folly and error. So there you go. Constantine wanted to make sure that he was involved in how Christianity was going to be shaped and developed in the Roman Empire. And, and what he mainly was concerned about was that his form of worship would be obtained and observed, and it would be propelled by this lack of desire or this hatred for the Jews and wanting to have fellowship with them. They hated the Jewish people. The only reason why they would be okay with Jewish people is if they would convert to their form of Christianity. And even an unbelieving Jew would look at Constantine's form of Christianity and say, wait, you're abandoning the customs? You're abandoning what, what God ordained? Why would I, this is what Christ looks like? Why would I want to come to that? That doesn't sound like the true Messiah. So this is a problem for the unbelieving world and how their perspective of Christianity would be. It would be deterring people from actually being saved. It would shut people out from Christ. But this anti-Semitism and this reshaped and developed Christianity would continue to be propelled throughout the next years. Moving on in history, we have Cyril of Jerusalem. This is what he said, fall not away, either into the sect of the Samaritans or into Judaism. For Jesus Christ has henceforth ransomed you. Stand aloof from all observance of Sabbaths and from calling any indifferent meats common or unclean. And so this was apparently Judaism to them. Is that anything that associated you with a Jew? That's Judaism. That's not what Judaism is, actually. The Sabbath is from the scriptures. And eating clean and unclean? That's from the scriptures. So they're, they're saying, don't do any of these things. That's falling away from Christ. That's a scary narrative that these people are peddling. You have put on Christ. You have become a member of the Lord and been enrolled in the heavenly city. And you still grovel in the law of Moses? How is it possible for you to obtain the kingdom? Listen to Paul's words that the observance of the law overthrows the gospel. And learn, if you will, how this comes to pass, and tremble, and shun this pitfall. Why do you keep the Sabbath and fast with the Jews? So Cyril of Jerusalem is warning people, are you, are you unaware what Paul says about observance of the Sabbath and dietary instructions? You want to go, you want to observe these things? Paul says that you're going to be shut out from Christ. You won't get salvation. This was the fear tactics that they were using for other people when they were trying to come and, and be, become a believer and they were reading in the, in the scriptures and seeing, wait, we're supposed to be doing these things. This was the narrative that was being presented to people. And so you want to know why? You want to ask why modern day Christianity doesn't do these things? It's because these mantras have been carried out from, from early centuries to today and still used as evidence for why we don't do them or why we shouldn't do them as Christians. Another key figure is Eusebius, who I've already quoted from, but he gives his, his perspective of what Christianity looks like as well. And it's very similar to Constantine and these other early Christians who let go of the line and, and did not want to observe the commandments of God. This is Eusebius and what his perspective is of Christian faith. But although we certainly are a youthful people, and this undeniably new name of Christians has only lately become known among all nations, nevertheless, our life and mode of conduct together with our religious principles have not been recently invented by us. But from almost the beginnings of man were built on the natural concepts of those whom God loved in the distant past, as I shall proceed to show. The Hebrews are not a youthful people, but are respected by all men for their antiquity and are known to all. Now the spoken and written records of this people embrace men of a very early age, scarce and few in number, but at the same time outstanding in religious devotion, righteousness, and all other virtues. Several of these lived before the flood, others after it. Some of Noah's sons and descendants, but especially Abraham, whom the children of the Hebrews boast as their own founder and ancestor. All these, whose righteousness won them commendation, going back from Abraham himself to the first man, might be described as Christians, in fact, if not in name, without departing far from the truth. Eusebius is setting up a narrative here. And he's saying that Abraham and some of the ones before him even were in name Christians because of how they lived. And you're going to see why he's setting this up uh, here in the next slide. Continuing on. For the name means this, that the Christian man, through the knowledge and teaching of Christ, excels in self-discipline and righteousness, in firmness of purpose and manly courage, and in an acknowledged devotion to the one sole God over all. And for all this they showed no less enthusiasm than do we, nor for the keeping of Sabbaths, 
nor do we, nor for abstinations from certain foods or distinctions between others, all that Moses was the first man ever to hand down, for later generations to carry out in symbols, nor do these things matter to Christians now. So there you go. These men, Abraham, Noah, and many early Christians before Moses didn't care about the Sabbath, didn't care about making a distinction between clean and unclean. They didn't care about the festivals. These are Christians because they didn't care about these things. So they're trying to find their roots. If it's a new religion, then it's not authorized. So they have to find their roots in the scriptures. It's, it's kind of hard to say, no, 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 guys, you just don't do those things, right? No, they got to twist the scriptures and shape even Abraham himself as someone who they can be okay with, who justifies their way of life. And you don't think they're going to reshape Christ? So let's look at Abraham and Noah and all these people before Moses and see what their perspective was on the law. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my statutes, and my laws. Huh. So you got to ask yourself, if Abraham kept his laws and obeyed his voice and his statutes and judgments, what, what laws were those? Did that include the Sabbath? I would say so, considering it was established at creation week in Genesis chapter 2. You don't think Abraham knew about that? Of course he did. And it says that he kept it. And then going to Noah, you don't think Noah cared about making a distinction between clean and unclean animals? His whole job depended on it. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark. You and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation, you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So you don't think Noah cared about making a distinction between clean and unclean animals? He was supposed to. He was commanded to, and guess what? He did it. So to say that they didn't care about these things is just a big lie. I mean, we can go all day with this, but you have people like David, who was called a man after God's own heart. And these are the things that he said about the law, which would include the Sabbath, dietary instructions and feast and the circumcision. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I delight to do your will. Oh, my God. And your law is within my heart. You rebuke the proud, the cursed who stray from your commandments. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set my heart on your laws. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. And so while Eusebius is saying that these people didn't care about these things, we see in the scriptures that that's not the case. So what faith is he talking about? What Christian faith is he referring to? Because the Christian faith that actually follows Christ loves his law and obeys his voice and his charge and his statutes and judgments. And God is pleased by them. So this anti-Semitic spirit kept on being perpetuated throughout the, the centuries, even into the Council of Laodicea. And what this tells me is that the issue concerning whether Christians should keep the Sabbath or keep the festivals and all these things was still an ongoing topic because they didn't deal with issues that were from centuries ago. They dealt with matters of that day. So the fact that they were saying the things I'm about to bring up in the slide tells me that this was still an ongoing conversation. And so at the Council of Laodicea, this is what was commanded. Christians shall not Judaize and be idle. There's that word idle again on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day, they shall especially honor. And as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Basically, what they're saying is if you want to go around telling Christians that they should be keeping the Sabbath, you're going to be shut out from Christ. You have no salvation. We will not recognize you as a Christian. So it's interesting that they're saying that you're going to be shut out from Christ, even though the scriptures point to the fact that the Sabbath is a sign between the Lord God and you that you are his people. Do you think that's something that Christ was working to annul? to do away with? Does that sound like the work of Christ? Or does that sound like the devil in history? Now we move on to Augustine, mentioned by John MacArthur, who was hailed again as a great Christian hero and uh, a great theologian. And this is his perspective on the Sabbath. And John MacArthur is right. Augustine did not observe the Sabbath. He did not think Christians should. And this is what he says. Well, now, 
I should like to be told what there is in these Ten Commandments, except the observance of the Sabbath, which ought not to be kept by a Christian. So there you go. See, John MacArthur's right. He did not observe the Sabbath, and it should not be kept by any Christian. It's interesting that Augustine is saying, I want to know about these these Ten Commandments, except for the Sabbath. I don't, I don't, really, care. I don't really care about that one, because Christians don't observe that. And this is his reason for why. Augustine and other Christians should not keep the seventh-day Sabbath. This Sabbath shall appear still more clearly if we count the ages as days. Oh, so this Sabbath that's commanded in Exodus 20, verse 8, it's, it's a lot more clear when you understand days as ages. Continuing. In accordance with the periods of time defined in Scripture, for that period will be found to be the seventh, the first age, as the first day extends from Adam to the deluge, the second from the deluge to Abraham, equaling the first, not in length of time, but in the number of generations, there being ten in each. From Abraham to the advent of Christ there are, as the evangelist Matthew calculates, three periods, in each of which are fourteen generations, one period from Abraham to David, a second from David to the captivity, a third from the captivity to the birth of Christ in the flesh. There are thus five ages in all. The sixth is now passing, and cannot be measured by any number of generations, as it has been said, it is not for you to know the times which the Father has put in his own power. After this period, God shall rest as on the seventh day, when he shall give us, who shall be the seventh day, rest in himself. But there is not now space to treat of these ages. Suffice it to say that the seventh shall be our Sabbath, which shall be brought to a close, not by an evening, but by the Lord's day, as an eighth and eternal day, consecrated by the resurrection of Christ and prefiguring the eternal repose not only of the spirit but also of the body there we shall rest and see see and love love and praise this is what shall be in the end without end for what other end do we propose to ourselves than to attain to the kingdom of which there is no end and so there you go Augustine's purpose for why you shouldn't keep the Sabbath or why he doesn't keep the seventh day Sabbath is because it's figurative it's figurative it's not it's not literal it's not a literal thing that you should be keeping. And while I'll agree that the commandments have a spiritual application, the spiritual application does not negate the literal application. And so this seems to be another narrative that was uh, propagated in these early centuries that they more had to make these commandments more of metaphors than literal applications. And you'll see that here as we continue. We have, again, going back to the letter of Barnabas, where he talks about the dietary instructions. Is there then not a command of God that they should not eat these things? There is. But Moses spoke with a spiritual reference. For this reason, he named the swine as much as to say, you shall not join yourself to men who resemble swine. For when they live in pleasure, they forget their Lord. But when they come to want, they acknowledge the Lord. And in like manner, the swine, when it has eaten, does not recognize its master. But when hungry, it cries out. And on receiving food, is quiet again. Neither shall you eat, says he, the eagle, nor the hawk, nor the kite, nor the raven. You shall not join yourself, he means, to such men as know not how to procure food for themselves by labor and sweat, but seize on that of others in their iniquity. And although wearing an aspect of simplicity are on the watch to plunder others, so these birds, while they sit idle, inquire how they may devour the flesh of others, proving themselves pests to all by their wickedness. So again, you have these people, these very uh, influential writings and, and figures, making it all figurative language. It's a spiritual application only. And so that's how they can reconcile when they go back to the scriptures like, hey, make sure you're not eating swine in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Make sure you're keeping the Sabbath and Genesis chapter 2 and Exodus 20 uh, and Exodus or Ezekiel 2020. All these scriptures, this is how they reconcile. They say, no, it's not really what it says. It has a deeper meaning, which is true, but the deeper meaning does not negate the literal application again. And if you don't think that this had any influence on, on Christians, let me just show you a very influential Christian in the last 200 years that uses very similar language that he'd only get from these writings. So Charles Spurgeon gives his sermon about clean and unclean animals, and this is what he says about the dietary instructions. The next creature mentioned in the chapter is the hare. The hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean. 
See how he flies with bounding step over the ground? A clapping of the hands and how he starts and is away. The hare is such a timid creature. She leaveth her food and fleeth before the passerby. I would not say a hard thing, but there are some people who appear to chew the cud. They love to hear the gospel preached. Their eyes will sparkle sometimes when we are talking of Christ, but they do not divide the hoof. Like the hare, they are too timid to be domesticated among the creatures whom the Lord has pronounced clean. They do not come out from the world, enter into the church, and manifest themselves wholly on the Lord's side. Charles Spurgeon is using Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 in a metaphoric way. He would never preach this having a literal application because he did not observe these dietary instructions nor the Seventh-day Sabbath. So... Again, this is how they reconcile these verses. Continuing on in history, we see still there are Christians standing up and saying, no, we should be observing these things. We should be observing the dietary instructions. We should be observing the Sabbath, the festivals, and the circumcision. And I know that because still we have, in the late 6th century, Pope Gregory commenting about this, that it has come into his ears that these men are saying these, what he refers to as perverse things. Let me read it for you. It has come to my ears that certain men of perverse spirit have sown among you some things that are wrong and opposed to the holy faith, so as to forbid any work being done on the Sabbath day. What else can I call these men but preachers of anti-Christ? This is why when I say you need to be able to discern the spirit of Christ or the anti-Christ in history and what these men are saying. And people usually say, well, it's not, it's not as black and white as you think it is, Andrew. No, it really is. And even Pope Gregory knows that. It's either the Antichrist or it's the it's the spirit of Christ that's telling you to keep the Sabbath. And it doesn't sound like these men who have perpetuated this Christian faith that was developed after the apostles are actually representing Christ and the true gospel. But continuing on, this is what he says, Who, when he comes, will cause the Sabbath day as well as the Lord's day to be kept free from all work. For because he, the Antichrist, pretends to die and rise again, he wishes the Lord's day to be held in reverence. And because he compels the people to Judaize that he might bring back the outward right of the law and subject the perfidy of the Jews to himself, he wishes the Sabbath to be observed. For this which is said by the prophets, you shall bring in no burden through your gates on the Sabbath day, could be held to as long as it was lawful for the law to be observed according to the letter. But after that the grace of Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has appeared, the commandments of the law which were spoken figuratively cannot be kept according to the letter. For if anyone says that this about the Sabbath is to be kept, he must needs say that carnal sacrifices are to be offered. He must say, too, that the commandment about the circumcision of the body is still to be retained. But let him hear the Apostle Paul saying in opposition to him, If you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. This is, again, why you see so many people using Galatians and Paul to say that, you know, we don't keep the circumcision at all, because if you do, you're shut out from Christ. You, won't, you will negate salvation. Because you have people like the Pope saying, that this is what Paul meant. But if you go back to Galatians, which we're not going to do right now, you can see that Paul was referring to a specific group that was convinced by the circumcision party that they had to be circumcised in the flesh before they had obtained any inheritance from the Lord. They had no salvation. Christ, well, he's fine. You can have him, but you need to be circumcised too in order to be saved, be a right standing with God, to be in reconcil reconciliation with him. You can't do anything until you do that. But that's not true. The Holy Spirit was falling on men who didn't know much about the law at all. And so putting the cart before the horse is what Paul was rebuking in these men and saying, now because you think that you have to do something in order to obtain eternal life, you're negating Christ because faith in Christ and by his grace is what brings us to saving faith. And once you have that saving faith, then you move on to sanctification, becoming more like Christ and what, what he did and how he behaved. But Pope Gregory, again, is using this verse out of context and, again, saying it's all figurative how these things apply. And, again, this narrative of Jesus bringing this new law that negates the old. And, by the way, we don't have a problem with saying that the sacrifices and the circumcision and anything else that the law prescribes is still legitimate. 
it just might not be able to be observed because of the lack of maybe a temple or or other things that would requ be required for a law to be kept i would turn this back on on pope gregory and say if you don't think any of the law that moses spoke of is still in existence after christ then do you steal do you lie do you murder well <laughs> actually they did <laughs> if they didn't follow along with their faith and their form of it they did kill people and called them heretics for it and so later on you have people who, you know, a beacon of light came shining with these reformers and all these people that stood against the Catholic Church and this faith that was developed. And they looked at it even centuries later and said, wait, I'm reading the Bible and I'm seeing a lot of things that this church that was developed in these early years is wrong about. So I need to get out of that. And that's what people like Martin Luther did as why, why he's hailed in, in many denominations as the, the, the great reformer. The only problem is, is that Martin Luther didn't withdraw himself fully from the Catholic doctrine. We know that because he didn't keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, he didn't keep the dietary instructions, and he didn't want to have any association with, with the people that did those things. He also had a form or a spirit of anti-Semitism in him, especially to those who didn't want to convert to his form of Christianity. That was a little different than, than Catholicism, but not too much different. And so while he was okay with Jews who were wanting to convert to his religion, those who did not, because they still stood on the fact that they should be observing the Sabbath, the dietary instructions, and the feasts, and the circumcision, he had no mercy for them. In his writing called The Jews and Their Lies, this is what he says. Set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians. Again, the spirit that went all the way to the reformers, they still maintain the spirit of that Christianity can be defined by this, not having anything to do with these Jews. That's how Christianity is defined. And that's how God knows that you're separate from these transgressing, hard-hearted, disgusting Jews. That's Christianity. And so Luther had no problem with this form of Christianity. And he continues, Learn this, dear Christian. What you are doing if you permit the blind Jews to mislead you, then the saying will truly apply. When a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into the pit. You cannot learn anything from them except how to misunderstand the divine commandments. See, when you talk to the Jews who say that they're literal, they're misunderstanding the divine commandments. But we have had our eyes and ears circumcised, and we understand and can see these scriptures, that they don't really mean a literal thing. It's a spiritual thing. This is the Christianity that was perpetuated. The spirit of wanting to have no communion or even being hostile towards Jews. And by the way, we're not just talking about unbelieving, Christ-rejecting Jews. We're talking about Messianic Jews who wanted to hold the line and say, no, we should be keeping these things. Something very concerning about this spirit is someone else who had a similar spirit and said similar things about Jewish people and the Ten Commandments. He goes by the name Adolf Hitler. Ever heard of him? Let me show you something that he says. The day will come when I shall hold up against these commandments the tables of a new law, and history will recognize our movement as the great battle for humanity's liberation from the curse of Mount Sinai. This is what we are fighting against, the masochistic spirit of self-torment, the curse of so-called morals, idolized to pr protect the weak from the strong, against the so-called Ten Commandments, against them we are fighting. So Hitler was fighting against the commandments and the so-called morals. That would include the Sabbath day. So did, did Hitler have the spirit of Christ or did he have the spirit of Antichrist? I don't think anybody in their right mind would say that he had the spirit of Christ. Although he might have thought he did. Hitler was no doubt a type of the Antichrist. And he fought against the Sabbath and all the commandments. He continues on. The Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a blemish like circumcision. You see Hitler's view towards the commandments, specifically in circumcision. It's very similar to what the, the previous men I, I showed you were also saying. 
it's very scary today because anybody who wants to look at these things and say, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. I should be wanting to follow Christ. And he told me that he didn't come to abolish the law, any part of the law. You have many modern day pastors and or preachers and teachers calling people like you and me heretics and that we've denied the faith or Pharisees. And this is concerning because if we're called these things, Christ had very harsh things to say against the Pharisees. Things like this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so to be called a Pharisee and and, and equating us to their spirit is is very harsh and it's very concerning it's not a, it's not a thing to take lightly and so it would be smart for us to look and say if we're being accused of being pharisaic then we should look and see why christ was so harsh to these people so let's find out why exactly he had a huge problem with the pharisees then the scribes and pharisees who were from jerusalem came to jesus saying why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? So here's the charge. The Pharisees are coming to Yeshua and saying, your disciples don't follow the traditions that we follow, that we've been following for centuries. Why aren't they doing that? And the tradition was that they had to wash their hands before and after the meal. And in the Mishnah, you will see that they still have those laws, that anybody who does not wash their hands is as though they had sinned with a harlot and they shall be uprooted from the earth. These are traditions. These are serious accusations that are going against the, the, the disciples, serious charges. And this is what Yeshua says. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Yeshua is rebuking these Pharisees for holding on to traditions that aren't even in the scripture, and holding them higher than commandments and even negating them. And so while many Christians and pastors will call those who want to keep the Sabbath and the dietary instructions and the fleshly circumcision and all, all things alike, they're called Pharisees. It's not accurate because the Pharisees, they did not keep the commandments of God, right? Was it not Jesus who told the Pharisees, this is, was it not Moses who gave you the law, and yet you don't keep the law? Why do you seek to kill me? From Yeshua's own mouth, he told the Pharisees that they were not keeping the law. And that was his rebuke to them. They were hypocrites for pretending to have a close relationship with God and not keeping his commandments. Instead, they were keeping traditions, commandments of men. And so ironically, the Christians calling those who keep the Sabbath, dietary instructions and feast and circumcision, Pharisees, are the ones guilty of the very thing they're accusing Torah keepers of. And so when I see people saying we don't keep these things because early Christians didn't keep them, well, look back and see what they kept them for. Look at the reasons why they kept them and didn't keep certain commandments. It's because they didn't like fellowship with the Jews. And so they, they made the scriptures and shaped them to their own perspective, making and forming and developing traditions that were perpetuated even till today. And so it's a scary thing to be in this position to reject these things that God has instituted for traditions like Sunday worship or denying the Passover and denying the feast and not making a distinction between the clean and the unclean. These are because traditions have infiltrated the church. This is why you're called a heretic. This is why you're called a Pharisee. If you observe these things is because the same spirit has been kept in all these churches even till today. And so while we have these pastors and these leaders that will say these things, I also want to give everybody in the Torah community uh, a little advice. Maybe you don't need it, but some people do. Just because people are teaching this, there are Pharisees out there, yes, but there are also people who are just deceived 
and they're not necessarily standing up and calling people heretics, but they're just confused. They've never heard these things before. So while the devil has been working in history, it's also apparent that Christ has also been working in history. And his work is also manifest not only in his ministry that we can see from the scriptures, but also in his apostles in the scriptures. We can see his heart, that he was about restoration. He was about reconciliation and seeking and saving the lost. And while there's many verses I can bring up to give validity to what I'm saying, while we're talking about history, I just want to read you something that Eusebius records about John the Apostle specifically that can give us a good perspective of what I'm referring to. So let me read it for you. Clement, in addition to indicating the date, adds a story that should be familiar to all who like to hear what is noble and helpful. It will be found in the short work entitled The Rich Man Who Finds Salvation. Turn up the passage and read what he writes. Listen to a tale that is not just a tale, but a true account of John the Apostle, handed down and carefully remembered. When the tyrant was dead and John had moved from the island of Patmos to Ephesus, He used to go when asked to the neighboring districts of the Gentile peoples, sometimes to appoint bishops, sometimes to organize whole churches, sometimes to ordain one person of those pointed out by the Spirit. So it happened that he arrived at a city not far off, named by some, and after settling the various problems of the brethren, he finally looked at the bishop already appointed and indicated a youngster he had noticed of excellent physique, attractive appearance, and ardent spirit. He said, leave this young man in your keeping with all earnestness in the presence of the church and Christ as my witness. When the bishop accepted him and promised everything, John addressed the same appeal and adjuration to him a second time. He then returned to Ephesus, and the cleric took home the youngster entrusted to his care, brought him up, kept him in his company, looking after him, and finally gave him the grace of baptism. After this, he relaxed his constant care and watchfulness, having put upon him the seal of the Lord as the perfect protection. But the youngster snatched at liberty too soon, and was led sadly astray by others of his own age who were idle, dissolute, and evil livers. First they led him on by expensive entertainments, then they took him with them when they went out at night to commit robbery. Then they urged him to take part in even greater crimes. Little by little he fell into their ways, and like a hard-mouthed powerful horse he dashed off the straight road, and taking the bit between his teeth rushed down the precipice the more violently because of his immense vitality. Completely renouncing God's salvation, he was no longer content with the petty offenses. But, as his life was already in ruins, he decided to commit a major crime and suffer the same fate as the others. He took these same young renegades and formed them into a gang of bandits, of which was the master mind, surpassing them all in violence, cruelty, and bloodthirstiness. Time went by, and some necessity having arisen, John was asked to pay another visit. When he had dealt with the business for which he had come, he said, Come now, bishop, pay me back the deposit which Christ and I left in your keeping. And in the presence of the church over which you preside as my witness, at first the bishop was taken back, thinking that he was being done for money he had never received. He could neither comply with the demand for what he did not possess, nor refuse to comply with John's request. But when John said, It is the young man I am asking for, and the soul of our brother, the old man sighed deeply and shed a tear. He is dead. How did he die? He is dead to God. He turned out wicked and profligate, in short, a bandit, and now, instead of the church, he is taken in the mountain with an armed gang of men like himself. The apostle rent his garment, groaned aloud, and beat his head. A fine guardian, he cried. I left our brother's soul. However, let me have a horse immediately, and someone to show me the way. He galloped off from the church, then and there, just as he was. When he arrived at the place and was seized by the bandit sentry group, he made no attempt to escape and asked no mercy, but shouted, This is what I have come for. Take me to your leader. For the time being, the young man waited, armed as he was. But as John approached, he recognized him, and filled with shame, turned to flee. But John ran after him as hard as he could, forgetting his ears and calling out, Why do you run away from me, child? From your own father, unarmed and very old? Be sorry for me, child, not afraid of me. You still have hopes of life. I will account to Christ for you. If need be, I will gladly suffer your death, as the Lord suffered death for us. To save you, I will give my own life. Stop, believe, Christ sent me. When he heard this, the young man stopped and stood with his eyes on the ground, Then he threw down his weapons. Then he trembled and began to weep bitterly. When the old man came up, he flung his arms around him, pleading for himself with groans as best he could, and baptized a second time with his tears, but keeping his right hand out of sight. But John solemnly pledged his word that he had found pardon for him from the Savior. He prayed, knelt down, and kissed that very hand as being cleansed by his repentance. 
Then he brought him back to the church, interceded for him with many prayers, shared with him the ordeal of continuous fasting, brought his mind under control by all the enchanting power of words, and did not leave him, we are told, till he had restored him to the church, giving a perfect example of true repentance and a perfect proof of regeneration, the trophy of a visible resurrection. This story from Clement I have included both for its historical interest and for the benefit of future readers. So in this encounter, you can really see John and really Christ's heart for the lost, for those who have come to an understanding of the truth, but in some way rejected it. That's really a lot of Christians today. They've come to an understanding of the truth, but they've either stopped or, or veered off. And who are we in the Torah movement to say, oh yeah, they're dead to God, demons. When, when John came and asked about this young man and, and the man who he left in charge of the young boy said he's dead to God, John didn't get up and say, oh, well, I guess you know, to heck with him. He was mourning for him. He wept for him and he chased him. He pursued him. And that's what Christ does. And it's what he did for us is he pursued us and gave us light. So why should we be any different when it comes to Christians who have been victims of all these er erroneous doctrines? But not all of them are standing up teaching these things. A lot of people are just victims, and, and we need to be able to give them the, the, the accurate way to understand the scriptures and not demonize them. Let's just all remember that as we're trying to lead people to the truth of the scriptures in a more accurate way, that Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. And he didn't stomp people down. Sure, he had harsh words to say for the religious leaders, and, and so do we. But the people who are victims need to be gently shown the way. I hope this presentation has been a blessing to you in some way, and I appreciate Sean for, for allowing me to have a platform to present this. I hope to see you all soon. If not in the flesh, then in the kingdom. God bless you.